Welcome to the 75th anniversary of NASA Ames Research Center and the Director's Colloquia Summer Series. NASA is a space exploration agency, an agency that supports uh, education and uh, the ability to improve our commercial and uh, academic uh, institutes. When you look at NASA, you think of science and engineering, but it takes a lot more than science and engineering to get everything completed. It's a whole family of different expertise and specialties that make things happen. Also, on a personal note, mentors are always important in your career. The more mentors you have, the more you could learn from their experience and improve what you want in terms of your vision for the future. Today's talk, entitled Lessons Learned in Route to Becoming Center Deputy Director by Lou Braxton. Mr. Braxton earned numerous degrees, uh, starting with a degree, a bachelor's degree from Cal State Fresno getting an MBA uh, from Golden Gate University, and an ex executive training uh, program degree from Harvard Graduate School of Business. He started his career at NASA 39 years ago. And he started, for the students in the audience, as a co-op student uh, in a, an, uh, accountant trainee at NASA Dryden Flight Research Center. He, will, he has demonstrated what it takes to become a leader within the agency. Please join me in welcoming Lou Braxton. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. This is a uh, unusual opportunity for me because uh, normally when I'm standing up here at this podium, I'm normally uh, uh, handing out awards or um, talking about some type of challenge we have to face at the center. Uh, this, this opportunity that Jacob came and encouraged me to do is basically is a, it's going to be a trip in time. It's basically going to give you an idea of where I came from, what I learned on the way, and I hope that when I get to the, the final couple of slides, uh, when we talk about actually being the uh, Deputy Center Director, you got an idea of you know, what made me who I am and why I work the way I do or why I tick the way I do. Okay? And also, probably a better understanding of what it takes to be in this position if you, if you aspire to do so. Um, but before we do that, I think the one thing we need to do is make sure you understand there was a whole bunch of people before I came along. And many of those individuals I worked for. And they all had different personalities. But the one thing I will tell you is, you know, about five years ago or six years ago, I decided to, to sponsor what we call a reunion. Once a year, we get together, those deputy directors who ever existed at Ames Research Center, and we have dinner. And we reminisce about what we've done, how we did it, where we've been, and how we whew, barely got by, OK? And one thing started coming out. I started realizing that the basic character traits that I had are not much different than many other men and women up there on that, on that wall. This is the duration of those individuals, how long they served in the position. And as you can see, I did my time. OK? And uh, the other individual, this facility is named after. Not only did he spend as much time as he did being the uh, deputy, being Syverson, Dr. Syverson, he also was our center director. I think he was our fourth center director here at uh, Ames Research Center. So let me give you an idea where I came from. This is a collage. You're going to see a number of these things. Yes, I was young at one time, OK? <laughs> you can see that uh, I knew where I was going to be right there at the age of three, man. I was telling everybody, OK? But as things went along, you know, 
I did have a background a lot of people don't realize in the city of Houston where I got exposed to things as a young Afro-American that I didn't want to see happen to my kids. I had to deal with the segregation issues that exist early on in life. And I still remember the fountains that pretty much said color people only can drink from. I can remember which side of the street I had to walk on in the city. And I can remember that when I went in the elevator and got lost, they thought I was going to blow up the entire Macy department store within uh, Houston with my mom running around being very, very upset about her baby's gone, her baby's gone. There's my mother. As my dad was in the military, and it wasn't long before that, uh, before uh, they got together, we were starting to live in a military type setting, and I lived in a very diverse communities from that point on. And as you can see, I tried to be a good Cub Scout. There I was in the backdrop there. Uh, I enjoyed it. And what a lot of people don't realize is that initially I wanted to be a forest ranger. I was so into the outdoors and exploring and doing things with nature that that was a desire that I had as I wanted to be a smoke jumper, then I wanted to be a forest ranger, and then things kind of got in the way. Smoke jumpers get hung up in trees. Fire burns people, trees and burn people. I decided I didn't want to be a smoke jumper anymore because I didn't want to be barbecued, okay? I wanted to say, well, then I'll just go out in the wilderness, be in the, long, you know, the camp, and be able to look out and tell what's going on in the forest. And then I realized, you know, I don't know if I can find a wife that want to be out there with me. <laughs> so I had to get rid of the idea of being a forest ranger because there was two strikes. I didn't want to burn up, and I, I know I was going to have to have companionship in my life, OK? But I was also very involved in sports. Tennis came into play. Baseball I was very good at. Uh, these, this is the high school championship team I had. A lot of people don't realize I graduated from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Not California, but Michigan. Where the winners get an average between January through uh, March, average minus 40 below. Okay? There are some people that were in my life that have been very inst inspiring. This is Grace Komodo. She was my fifth grade teacher. She made it very clear to me throughout the entire year that I was in her class that I can make things happen any way I wanted to make it happen. She supported me. She was a taskmaster. She actually came over to my parents' houses at times to make sure that I followed through on my homework because I thought it was more fun to do this than to listen to her at times, OK? But she was very inspiring. This individual here, Ron Williams, was my tennis coach in junior college. He too was very inspirational and believed in me and supported me. He made sure that uh, I was a walk-on after I came back from Michigan. I made the team and I became the number one seat on that tennis team. And we traveled up and down through California and one of the reasons I'm here at Ames is because I used to come out here to De Anza, Foothill, uh, Kenyatta, compete against them, and I was familiar with the area, and I knew to come here. I knew what the area was going to be like. But all in all, uh, I had good times. There's my little birthday party. Okay. But as you can see, I love being with groups, teams, things that can make things happen. As a result of that, there were some things I learned in those first few years, probably the first 20 years. My parents are very inspirational, and making sure I understood these things. Be fair when you can be fair with people. Keep your commitments. One thing that my father hated was somebody getting involved with something and then backing out on it. Once you got involved, stick through it. See it all the way to the end. Be careful. Now, the be careful part is primarily because I was Afro-American. And because the way things were, they wanted to make sure that you go out, give everybody the benefit of the thought, you know, the benefit of the doubt about things, but always make sure you're a little careful about what can happen to you because of the way things were going in the country at the time. Be prepared. There is value in every human being, and I got to tell you that I've seen that in my entire life. I don't care how ugly a person can get. If you get them away, talk with them, sit with them for a while, you'll find there is value that they have that they can share to a solution to something. Your best weapon is your mind. 
is actually a phrase that's taken from the military. My dad was Air, in Air Force, flew in B-52s, and they always used to tell them the best military weapon that they had was the human mind. I trans, you know, took that in and used that as far as helping me understand how to deal and battle things if I had to. And more important, don't, afraid, don't be afraid to admit you're wrong. Own up to it. Be accountable. You find that people will really love to follow you more if you stand up and let them know that, hey, you know, I screwed the pooch. Now let's keep moving on. Education, I learned that when I told a story, try to make it as simple as possible. They are the best stories. People will stick with you and stay around. History repeats. I love history. The only difference between the Romans and us in the United States today is technology. The way we think, the way we behave, the desires we have, they're all the same. It's just that the tools we use make things happen a lot faster and a lot quicker. Lead by example and you earn trust. Throughout this, you're going to see trust is a key to people wanting to pick you, choose you, make you a part of whatever you're doing to get things done. Be prepared to exhibit a profile in courage. John F. Kennedy, I remember reading this book when I was 12 years old. He wrote a book called Profile and Courage. There wasn't an individual, there wasn't a story he wrote in that book where it didn't turn out bad for the person, but they did the right thing. And you have to stand by your convictions and be prepared to do the right thing, even though it means from that point in your life you may have a lot of struggles. I always marvel that, that book. Now sports, I just love it because of a lot of things that came out of it. Leadership extends beyond the field of play. And the sports I was involved with, whether it was baseball, football, uh, basketball, tennis, if I was a leader, I was a leader off the field as well as was on the field. People expected that. Trust equals success. And success builds trust. Always keep that in mind. Must have a sound, sound foundation. Hey, you can't get anywhere unless you make sure you deal with the basics. A lot of the people I work with today understand I always want to make sure I have the right people in the right spot, the right tools and the right amount to make sure we get something done. Small teams work more effective, in my opinion. Big teams are very common and hard, but if you get a small group, I think of the Spanish Armada. That's where I get this from. S sailing to take over England, had to deal with the gales and the storms, and then the little Sp English ships come out and whip their tail. And what I learned from that is I get a small group. And I've done this in my career here. I'll pick three or four guys or gals, and we go out, and we make it happen. And then we go out and have a wine or beer and talk about, hey, we just kicked butt. All right? Diverse teams are strong. You compete to win. And the best player doesn't guarantee to win. Ask LeBron <laughs> in Miami. <laughs> they, didn't get the, they didn't get it this year, OK? And lastly, be resilient. You may not be able to go straight ahead, but tack your way. I found in this country, in this organization, if you just keep being persistent, you'll get there, you'll be on top. So now, I arrived at Dryden in January the 31st, 1975. And I walked into the personnel office, and the lady comes up to me and says, are you Lou Braxton? And I said, yeah. She looked at my resume, and then she runs out. Her name was Dora Borjan. And she runs out to the rest of the personnel office and goes, we got another one, and we didn't even try. <laughs> OK. So there I was, fulfilling my obligations or affirmative action, didn't even know I was doing it, OK? But Dryden was a fun period of time. The first year, I got to fly to C-47. In those days, the test pilots had to go out and do what they call a proficiency test. And I had the opportunity to go ride in the aircraft with them. And when they were done, I can remember banking over Riverside, <laughs> flying to C-47, thinking I was the coolest cat in the world, even though I didn't know how to comb my hair, as you can see there. <laughs> but it was, a, you know, it was a good, good time. As well as I made three good close friends there. There was Bud Merritt. I had to catch him. And there was uh, Bernie Kill. Unfortunately, Bernie has passed away, but Bud and Ida are still around. And when I went down for the dedication, the Armstrong dedication, I met them. And they're still around, and they're good friends of mine. But they're the ones that pretty much said, where's that little kid? He's out there in the graveyard where they, where they put all the skeleton of the aircraft. 
He's sitting around trying to act like he could fly him. In fact, the X-15 that's in the Smithsonian Institute right now off of Independence Avenue in Washington, D.C., I used to sit in that thing day in and day out, act like I was a test pilot. And then one day the clamps went across my leg to keep the pilot steady and I couldn't get out of the daggum bird. And I was out there for an hour and a half in the heat trying to make sure I didn't get in trouble. <laughs> and finally realized I was going to have to own up to the fact that I was a bad boy when I turned the clamps went off and I never won that bird again because I got out. <laughs> then I came to Ames. And as you can see, it's active in sports. There's Eric. Eric's somewhere around here taking pictures. One of my good buddies in sports. And I did long distance running and we had a team from the financial management side of the house in the early days. And you can see we couldn't afford clothes in those days, but we did come out and play softball. And you didn't have a fence around the Dagum uh, uh, airfield at the time. You could walk right up to the flight line because we played ball and chased our softball out into the flight line. But then as I started getting more and more mature, I had to go to these formal things called offsites. And this is one that when I was starting to get into the management world at a Cellamar and had to start trying to learn, understand how we do things within the agency. So these are some of the lessons I started learning in those early years. Transparency earns trust. I can't stress that enough. Don't like it a lot of times because you have to be accountable to yourself. But if you want to make sure you have people that follows you to get things done, be as transparent as you can. Reaction to change is relative and personal. What I mean by that is, give you two examples. As a young branch chief, we remodeled the entire work area by putting in modular furniture. Everybody who was here working for me at that time hated it. Thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen. They lost their privacy. They couldn't, uh, the people could look in and see, oh, it was just a bad deal for them. On the other hand, every new employee I hired thought it was the best work environment they ever came to. It depends on where you are at a given period in time. We're dealing with something similar right now when it comes to Google. A lot of employees right now have a problem because Google's on the left, it's on the right, it's on the back. And they think, oh, we're getting surrounded. But they don't, they don't remember that Ames is really initially was 500 acres. And we had the Navy on the left, we had the Navy on the right, we had the Navy in the back. Nobody complained in those days. They completely surrounded us. It's relative. Depends on where you are at a given point in time. Expectations are for timely decisions. Can't stress that enough. People want timely decisions. They want things to take place. Most people want to be led. There's a debate there because most people will come and say, no, I just want to be involved. How many meetings you've been involved with and everybody's around the table and they're talking and it isn't until somebody says, we're going to do this and everybody says, okay, let's go. So in my book, most people want to be led, okay? NASA brand is so powerful. St story I have there, essentially, when I was co-oping and I was trying to get housing, and it was very difficult for me to get housing. Here I was, scrawny little black dude, walking up and says, hey, I need a, I need a place to live, whether it was in Fresno at the time or whether it was up in uh, Lancaster. And each time I went up to somebody, it would tell me no. And basically, they wanted the first, they wanted the last, and the current, current month rent. By accident one day, I put on a NASA t-shirt. It had the shuttle on top of a 747. I walked up to a uh, landlord to see if I could get a place. He says, do you work for NASA? I said, yeah, I'm a co-op student there. You gotta be exceptional. And I says, okay, can I get a place? He says, sure. I says, what about the first? You don't need a first. You don't need a last. All you need to do is pay your monthly rent. You got a place. So I thought, well, that's just an anomaly because that happened in Lancaster, aerospace world, okay? Then I turned around and came to Fresno. I said, I'm gonna wear the shirt. <laughs> Walked up, same thing happened. That brand within this agency is very, very powerful. It sends a message out that you're somebody special, extremely special. Don't forget that. So now I'm getting past the point of thinking that my life is all about tennis. And now I'm starting to realize that I'm going to make some choices as far as what I'm going to do to help lead in the agency. Still, I was getting around. And then I fell in love with this lady one day. And uh, she can't answer no questions because <laughs> if she asks any questions, I'm just going to melt. But in any event, we decided that we're going to make a go of it. 
And I said, you know, I believe in arrow, and I'm going to take you up in a glider. And she thought that was going to be the greatest trip in her life. <laughs> and it was until the end. Because in, in, during the flight, the guy flew us over Fremont. He asked us if we wanted to do any acrobatics. And she goes, yeah. So the guy took a nosedive. <laughs> and it looked like we were going to do a 3-6. And it came out. And she said, oh, this is fantastic. And then the guy says, look, we want to do another one. She goes, yeah. So he, of course, drews us down into the sky over Mission Peak, and we come out of the corkscrew, and she's all happy, and the guy says, where's your house? And we said, oh, over here. The glider flies over there. Where's your house? It's a house with one of those pools, and we looked at every damn house had a pool. <laughs> so it took us a while before we found a house. And then we came, and we land where they now have the auto mall in Fremont. It used to be an open field. And she says, well, how many times are we going to get an opportunity? I says, we get one time because there's no engine, and it's going to, he's going to do a good job. And we hit the ground, and she thought it was great. We talked to the pilot, and then she looked over her shoulder and saw them popping the wings off. And she said, that, the wings come off that easy? I said, yeah, we haven't been up since. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't been up since. OK? But the main thing about this collage, this is about the middle, but there's a couple of people you start seeing, I'm starting to associate. This was the, end up being the deputy center director at Ames, which time is Bill Dean. Fig Peterson was the deputy center director at the time as they were sending me off to Harvard Business School to be the executive training. You can see my friends here, John Spicer, unfortunately, is not with us anymore because in about 20 years ago, he and I and another group, Phil Flume, and we were hiking up Mount Shasta. He summit, altitude sickness hit him. He walked off the mountain. He died. He's still there. And so he's a very dear, dear spot in my heart. I still see his family in Baltimore. Every time I have an I could get out there. And we used to go around hiking. Kathy Rita, Phil Flugeman, and myself, we go hiking. Eugene Mai and I, we finally summit Shasta. That's what this picture is about. We're on top of Shasta. But I believe in teams. You can see my team with Herbie Fingers still around. You can see John in the, in the background there, Spicer, D. Green right here, Damon out in Building 255 still around. I got to know a lot of people through sports at this place, which helped me be effective. Because as I grew up and they grew up and we got in positions of authority, we made things happen. Okay. This is my tennis buddy from the time I was in high school to this current point. We're still together. So this is letting you know I'm getting into the running, fell in love, got, dis you know, got distracted trying to figure out how to stay, you know, focus on things. But this was the middle years. And these are the things I started learning. Change is constant. Nobody likes change. We're always trying, we're fighting it, but it is constant. Once you accept that in the job, you'll be much more effective. But there are some things you can do to address, I call it the four pillars of power. Knowledge, information, positional authority, and who you know. Those four elements of power Normally, make sure you can address change and make things happen. The rule of thumb is, if you know, if you have knowledge and information, it's the most lasting power base you can have. And the most fleeting is positional authority and who you know. And if you want to be entirely effective in making things happen, the rule of thumb is normally, make sure you have one of these two, information or knowledge, or combined with either positional authority or who you know. And you can make things happen. It's just something I found to be very effective. My bosses have noticed it, took advantage of it in order to make sure things happen. The other, th excuse me, the other thing I started realizing is people leave, live for convenience. And what I mean by that is, is that you start realizing that a lot of times people don't want to be accountable for or they don't want to be in the middle of something that they don't think, they don't know how it's going to end. And if somebody else was to take advantage of that and take care of it for them, they like that. On the other hand, if you're trying to get people to be motivated to go somewhere and do things, make their life as comfortable as possible, and you're going to keep them. It's just our nature. I like things to be easier for me. It's just the nature of what we are as human beings. The, the other thing I had to learn was managers are measured on how well they utilize people, money, and facilities. Not just people, not just money, not just facility. All three. All three is, is what you use in your equation to get things done within an organization. Solve problems, don't defer them. Boy, that was a hard lesson for me to learn. 
A lot of managers like to say, I got a problem over here, and normally as an individual. If I could just get them into another organization, my life is going to be better, OK? So we figure out how we're going to promote the person up, or we figure out how we're going to ladder the person out. So that if that person is in another organization, then I don't have that problem anymore. The problem that I found in life is I was still developing as a manager, and as I grew up in the organization, I inherited my problem back. Okay? <laughs> I remember running to a guy named Chuck McClinton, one of my mentors and one of my dear, dear friends, and said, ah, man, this is great. I saw this. I saw this. I'm the branch chief of the financial management control organization, and this particular individual is out of the organization. We're going to be a top-notch organization. Three months later, you're going to go into the general accounting branch. I go into the general accounting branch. Who do I get? The same guy that I have transferred <laughs> over there. And I, my lesson from there was, I'll never do that again. You know, I'm going to deal with the problem. Don't defer it. So now I get to the CFO world. And you can see a little bit more clean cut. No afro, OK? I really get into golf, being that corporate look. But my team is always still there. As you can see, when we're in the CFO world, we really had a good team at times, one of the best teams that I had. And I, sometimes I sit back and reminisce on that, because it was so much fun working with those individuals to make things happen. Up here is another good team. They got a name from this gentleman who was the center director for a while, which is uh, Scott Hubbard. And I'm standing here with the time, with our center director at that time, which was uh, Harry McDonald. We had a group called the Killer Bees. I didn't give it that name. He did. He didn't kind of like them bees. But we got that name because all of our last names began with B. It was Jack Boy, who's my mentor today, that still comes in my office and gives me heck about, I'm 29 years younger than him, OK? It was Nancy Bingham, famous for you got to understand. She always pointed her finger and said, you got to understand. And Bill Berry, which I just got a picture from today from Jack, sitting on top of a house in the mountains, talking about this is the life. He was the deputy director at the time. And of course, I was CFO. And the rule of thumb in those, that period of time, a lot of people found out, is if we get two of those four individuals, to agree to your idea, your idea was accepted. It was even better than that. People used to go and look and see if our cars were parked out here. And if they saw two of the Killer Bees cars, they rushed in, convinced them that this is what needs to happen, and walked out and felt really good. I didn't know all this stuff until after I was the CFO. Okay? <laughs> but in any event, again, the people that I started associated with. Now, this gentleman here. He's sitting in the audience. His name is Don James. He don't look the same. Okay. <laughs> but it's Don James. Dear friend, uh, I went through a period of time where I had to go through a separation as far as a divorce. I had nowhere to go, literally nowhere to go. This guy picked me up like a little puppy dog and put me in his, uh, in his house and let me live with him for two years until I could get on my feet always be indebted and always be grateful for that. He uh, lived up to many of the values and concepts that I believe in life. So um, I was going to be a part of who I am. Things I learned in the CFO, greed and fear. Now, this is not because I was a CFO and I had money. Okay? <laughs> but I had a mentor by the name of Jack Boyd that used to come in and talk to me and tell me that if you want to motivate individuals to go in a direction, you need to start understanding the basic concepts of what motivates a human being. And it's greed and fear. A lot of people interpret that to be money. They're related to money. It's not money. It could be passion. Okay? It could be a hobby that you desire and you can't get enough of. It's to understand that an individual is going to want a lot of one thing or a lot of another thing, or they don't want to deal with a lot of one thing or another thing. And if you find what it is for that individual, you start motivating them in a direction. Now, it's a fine line between doing good when you take advantage and understand that and doing bad. Because the other thing that comes out of this sometimes time by people is manipulation. And nobody wants to be manipulated. So you have to be able to figure out how to take advantage of that understanding that it goes for a good. Okay. The equity factor. Boy, did I learn that in the CFO world. I thought at one time the center was going to be a billion dollar center. We worked hard on paper. It looked like we were going to get there. And then finally, 
it hit me, NASA doesn't allow anybody to grow. NASA doesn't allow anybody to shrink. NASA wants everybody to be the same. It's called the equity factor. It's very seldom do you see a major growth in one center versus another center within this agency because they want everything to be balanced and calm and equitable. Keep that in mind. That's just the way this agency works because everybody is trying to make sure they satisfy their colleagues. Because you never know from one day to the next when that colleague of yours might be your boss. Or you, the boss, may end up being the subordinate. That's the way this agency kind of works. It's a lesson I learned. Uh, senior positions bring unexpected responsibility. When I first became a senior executive CFO, I said, great, I'm going to run the CFO office. That's all I'm going to concentrate on. The next thing I know, even though I was born Afro-American, I became Hispanic, uh, had disables, dis disabilities. Um, I know that the Asian community wanted me to join their family. I started being a representative for everybody because I was one of the few minorities or underrepresented group in a position of authority. I didn't expect that. That was overwhelming when I first got into the position because people were looking for my help, my guidance, and my ideas of how to make things happen. And I had to learn and understand that it brings things that you didn't account on. And you have to rise up to the occasion. Better to be 80% right than to, to provide untimely decisions. And I'm not talking about my scientists being 80% right on the design of a circuitry, circuitry board. Okay? I'm talking about managerial decisions. Okay? I learned in college, and I watch people, that basically you could analyze something to death. You can analyze it, I mean, to the nth degree. But the success rate of somebody who analyzes everybody and flipping the coin is about the same. It's 50-50. So if you get in a position where you get to the point where time is of essence and you need to make that call, you need to make that call, make the call. 80% of the time, I've found that I'm going to be right. Okay. There will always be two sides to a coin. I don't think he's here today. I got this actually from Chuck Duff when he was my deputy. There's an argument. There's two sides to the story. It's basically what they're saying. But it's the edge that's always the interesting part to try to understand. Because if you listen to this side, they're right. You listen to this side, they're right. But when you put the two together and you look at the edge of that story and mill it together, that's normally about what it's about. And it helps guide you where things should be, how you should go about making a call on a decision. Cherish power. I got that from a gentleman named Willie Brown here in the, uh, the Bay Area. Probably one of the most scrupulous state politicians this state has ever produced. But the one thing he said that always stuck with me is, is that power is very cherishable in this sense. If you overuse it, you lose it. If you're going to use it, be very selective when you use it. Because if you overdo it, the way our country is, people start getting together, they start rallying around on the others, and they're going to take you out. So be very selective when you decide to pull the hammer. So uh, the last one is watch out for antibodies. I got that from Bill Barry, Deputy Center Director here, that I work for as a CFO. If you push something, that's why I brought this little this little uh, toy, I call it my antibody toy. If I'm going to tell somebody they can't do something, I get the same response on the end, the same energy level. If I decide to up that energy level to two, I get the same response on the back side. If you're going to get into a scrap with somebody, you better understand the energy you put into it is probably going to be the equal amount of energy coming back. And you better be prepared to address that. So don't take it lightly. If you're going to make a decision, use your power. Understand that once you push that button, there's no such thing as a, oh, I understand. I'm just going to walk and accept what you have to do. There's going to be a pushback. Realize that's going to happen. So now I'm old. <laughs> OK? Now I'm the deputy center director. And a lot of people don't know how that happened. And I'll tell you how it kind of happened, because um, a gentleman by the name of Pete Warden came to me one day at the golf course. And Pete Warden and I were fussing like you wouldn't believe about getting access to Hangar 1 when it still had a side, OK? 
And he wanted to be able to have people to go in and walk inside a hangar. I said, there's no way. That hangar has been designated as a environmental problem. We're not going to deal with the liability of somebody going in there and getting contaminated. So we fussed all day, and he you know, went away. And I'm over at the golf course, and he's drinking his wine, and I'm drinking my beer. And he says, Lou, let's talk. And he pulled me aside. I said, Pete, I told you, nobody going in that hangar. OK? Oh, I don't want to talk to you about the hangar. What do you want to talk to me about? He says, uh, I've been giving it a lot of thought, and I want you to be my deputy center director. I said, what? He said, that's not the hangar. <laughs> he said, no, I want you to be the deputy center director. And I says, look, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that's, that's the right call. And that's true. I didn't think it was the right call. I said, in this agency, it is very, very rare for somebody who hasn't in the technical side to be the deputy. Associate directorate, yes. On the technical side, that's rare. Okay. And I told him, I'm not too sure I'm the best guy. There's a gentleman in here that I still respect highly and think very, very highly and go and consult with, and that's Steve Zorniser at the time. And I was thinking, Steve ought to be that deputy director. Okay? And Pete said, no, I want you to be that. I says, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this. I need to talk to my spouse. My spouse always says, yeah, but I use it as an excuse. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, finally I says, OK, I'll agree to do this. But you need to go and talk to the various people to make sure they're comfortable. Because I thought I'd be better as an associate director of the institution, because that's where my skill base kind of came up through. And so I used to always wonder whether or not coming, being in a deputy position, whether you can even manage a laboratory without having a technical background. And as you can see, this has been good times, very good times. My wife and I have been enjoying our lives up to this point in time. Uh, I snuck a ride on the Airship Vincer, so I'll probably get the IG now on my butt. Um, you can see our team together. We work, we fight, we love, we play, but we get things done. And of course, I haven't abandoned my golf, and I have my three soul, soulmates here that I could go out and talk to. I don't have to worry about them uh, running amok and sharing things they shouldn't share. And I have a cl close buddy here, Woodrow Wilson, who I went away for a year to be the, the uh, associate director of the Mission Support Director at headquarters. And here's my foundation, starting with Chuck McClinton. I waited to now to talk about this. How was I found to come to Ames Research Center? Chuck really believed, really believed that he had a quest to make sure we diversified our workforce, and specifically in the areas associated with Afro Americans. He heard about me at Dryden. He heard that I wasn't going to be picked up at Dryden. I actually was being wine and dine to be an exec, if you want to call it that, at the time at Security Pacific Bank at, when I graduated from Fresno State. Chuck went to the little town of Atwater outside of Merced. His daughter was participating in the parade. He started walking up and down the line asking people if they knew the Braxtons. He finally found a person that says, yeah. His brother is over there. Talked to my brother Anthony, told him where my parents were. My parents told him where I was at Fresno. He got in contact with me, and he wanted me to come work for him. That's how he went out and recruit. And that's how he found me. And I made the decision to come to Ames. And haven't regretted it. People like Hans Mark is a dear, dear friend, believes in me, supports me. I, I could call him and be there, and he'd be responsive. And this is somebody who used to be a center director. Harry McDonald is doing the same thing. I call him, he'll be there. Okay. So, but this is my foundation with Chuck and a lot of the legacy of our financial management group that came to celebrate his birthday and his time about two years ago. And he's still around. So what did I learn? Stay behind the scene as a deputy center director. I'm not the director. I'm there to support. I'm there to carry out his policies. I'm there to make sure he's successful. I may not always agree, but that is my job as the deputy. Politics, poli politics, politics, politics. Boy, I didn't have any. You know, I thought politics was about you and I having an issue or listening to Jack talk about Jill at work. No, I'm talking about Capitol Hill. I had no idea how much involvement I had to deal in Washington. And I have to tell you, I had no idea why I voted for some of the people I voted for once I met them in Washington. <laughs> okay. 
I, I've sat in some of these rooms and you know, you walk in and you okay, I've got this impression that this is a very intelligent person and they understand what's going on. When I walked out, I said, how did it get here? <laughs> but there is an extreme amount of politics in this job. Which brings me to the next point, okay? Understand, and this is something I had to really learn all the way through my career, organized labor is here to stay. Organized labor is here to stay. It's good. But I didn't initially accept that because I accepted the fact that they were trying to tell me I didn't know how to do my job. And I had been successful up to this point in time in doing my job. But I got to remember something. There's a team. They're part of our team. And that team has a different vision than we have as managers or as we as individuals. And it's important that they speak up and share that vision that they see so that we have an idea to make sure we don't go off track. Because I got to tell you, I had a discussion just recently with the president of the union a couple of days ago or last night, and something came up that I did not see. Never would have known it if we hadn't had the discussion. Okay? So they're here. There's goodness about it. They're here to stay. Federal agencies shape social change. A lot of people don't like that. They understand they get their program dollars. I, I want to I launch my rocket. I want to do my biology. I want to make sure I design the best computer. But you work for the federal agency. And the federal agency is about social change. A president comes in, and he or she is going to mandate that we're going to do something a little bit different during their administration. If you accept that, it's a lot easier to get your job done. If you get to that point that, oh, no, I don't need to do that, then you're losing sight of the whole reason why you're working in the federal sector. It's here for social change. But federal laboratories at the time, they have opportunity to shape history or make history. Think of Kepler. I'll never, ever forget the fact that this is the center that first discovered there's other planets in the universe documented other planets list they exist in the universe. That's history. A hundred years from now, somebody's going to be digitizing the story, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to say, Ames Research Center. Now, I failed in one thing. I want one of those planets to be named after me. I wanted a Braxton planet. <laughs> I really tried hard to get that Braxton planet. All I got was K42B. <laughs> and then they gave me paperwork from California Department of Motor Vehicle to change my name to K42B, and that will be the way I get my name after a planet, okay? Needless to say, I'm not gonna do that. And then lastly, the thing that I, like I said, is the question I always had when Pete asked me to do this job, can a general manager who doesn't have a technical background manage a federal laboratory, and I'm here to submit I came to the conclusion the answer is yes. I've been very effective in doing so in my mind. And so that was one of the questions that I had myself doubting a little bit when the man asked me to do the job. So here's a collage basically dealing with ethnicity, race. It is a part of my life. I do not deny that. I cherish that. I want people to understand that. My father is the one that basically showed me the roads of how to cope with many of the adversities that he had to deal with as an officer in the US Air Force. And I watched him and how he had to deal with those challenges. One of the things I didn't learn from him, it says, don't ever volunteer. And I volunteer a lot of times, and I should have listened to him, OK? These young ladies and the men involved in the AAAG, they've always been there. They've always been there for me. They understand what I may be going through. They understand the challenges that I face day in and day out. A lot of people don't realize you have your deficiencies that you have to deal with in life. But a lot of people don't realize if I dress in a suit and I walk into Walmart or Penny's, it's automatically people assume I'm a teller and I work there. That doesn't happen on occasions. That happens every flipping time I walk into a department store, if I'm wearing a suit. If I'm wearing regular clothes, I'm going to say turtle, uh, a, a t-shirt, jeans, blue jeans, and a hat, 
and I'm driving a nice looking car, I get pulled over. I get pulled over routinely. I got a nice Mustang. Many of you know I own a 1970 Mach 1 Mustang. I've been pulled over in that thing about three times because people can't believe I own my own car. Okay? And giving me the reasons for why they had a problem with it is because either the license plate was being covered up or you, you know, it was too much mud on the front of something. But we knew, I knew what was going on. But that's just a fact in life. It's just a fact in life. And what I really in found is, is that you got to start measuring people based on the content of their character. You just went through a trip. You can see my foundation is finance. I want to make sure people see that. Here's my family. That's my entire family. That's my wife, my daughters, my son, my grandkids. Unfortunately, my father's not in this picture because he was battling lung cancer at the time, but he's now in, doing good. But that's the foundation to help me get through everything in life, to get to the point where I am today, why I can tolerate the times that Pete wants to be maybe a little expressive, for those of us who know what expressive <laughs> is with Pete, or tolerate the times when it doesn't make sense to me why headquarters wants to micromanage us when we know better how to make sure things get done. It's having that solid foundation. So I put a lot into the content of my character, and I put a lot into the content of you as individuals, your character. And by all those lessons that I've learned through the roadmap of my life, I've been able to, be, to get to the position I am because people have sought me. I didn't seek them as much as they sought me. It started with Chuck coming after me. Pete came after me. A gentleman by the name of Ralph Robinson who was a CFO, he came after me. People came after me because I followed many of those rules and I tried to make sure I make their life easier for them. So what did I get in return? This is what I got in return. Man, this is great. I don't know how many people, I went to Harvard Business School about five years ago and says, I'm a little depressed, I think I ought to get out of here. They said, are you crazy? I spent all my life trying to figure out how to make paper more proficient. And you get to meet dignitaries, you get to go to distance planets, you get to see technology, and by the time the guy finished raking me over the coal, he says, you know, you're right. I got it pretty good. This is what I got for being here at this laboratory. I'm very proud to be a part of, this, of your team because I could put my name associated with everything up there, whether it's Kepler, Iris, Laddie, L Cross. We had our opportunity with Curiosity, air traffic management, till rotors, space station work, CubeSats. You know, we did a lot in the tenure that I was the deputy center director and very proud to be a part of that. Okay. So with that, that's my story, that's my trip. Uh, I've been with this agency, like I said, 39 and a half years. I don't think it's going to go to 41. So <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and I hope that you enjoyed the story I shared with you. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone and stand when you get the microphone. Hey, Louis. I think this is what you got. This is what you got. But what one mistake did you make? What one mistake I made? <laughs> I have a weakness, so I won't say that one mistake. That it's caused me to make a number of mistakes, and that weakness is I can be very impulsive. I want to get something, I want to get something done, and so that weakness will cause me to make a statement or say something that I regret I should have said, shouldn't have said, because I could be so impulsive. I have done that in my dealings with organized labor. I own up to that, that it's been a mistake. I have done that sometimes working with some of my uh, employees. Okay, as far as things getting done in a timely manner or getting done the right way. Those are mistakes. And so uh, I think I'm better at it, but I still got to watch about it because I, I like to get across the finish line. Okay. Uh, Lou, what has been one of your most trying moments uh, in your 39 years here at Ames? 
<laughs> it might have been the time that I was in the bathroom with somebody trying to get a budget completed when wouldn't let me wouldn't let me get out of the stall. That was a trying moment. <laughs> uh, uh, seriously, um, probably. Um, it actually turned out to be good, so just make sure I couch it that. It's when Scott Hubbard came to me and decided that he no longer wanted me to be the CFO. That was a very trying moment. In the sense that I like to make sure I completed things. And I didn't feel as though I got to complete the things I wanted to complete when I was the CFO, okay, at that time. And, uh, and they put me in a job to be the center ops, basically. And um, at, I just thought I got demoted. And I wanted to try to figure out how was I going to be able to walk tall and feel strong enough that I still had what the center desired. Uh, it was kind of interesting, though, when I went to other centers, they all thought I got promoted. Because within the agency, the center op position is considered to be more prestige than the CFO job. But in my mind, the CFO job was more prestige, and I had to work through that. Okay. So that was very, very trying. And then, uh, of course, the rest is history. You know, I got a CFO job, and we did a few Yuri's nights, and uh, made sure that we uh, took on the uh, desires of Peter, trying to make sure we make NASA cool again. And he saw that, and it leveraged me into the, the deputy position. It made, it, made, it made the opportunity available, which I don't think would have happened if I was CFO. Right here. Right here. Hi, Louis. Um, you mentioned towards the end an episode where um, you were getting basically disrespected because of your color. Is this worse now, better now, than it was when you were younger? Uh, I think it's better now only because I live in California. Okay, let me make sure you understand that. The year that I spent in Washington, D.C. was an eye opener. I thought the rest of the nation had progressed as far as I think Northern California has. And, and I'll make it clear, I think Northern California is leaping bounds over Southern California, okay, when it comes to dealing with ethnicities. Um, but it is better in my mind, based on the environment that I'm living in, it's better. But once I get outside this protected, what I call cocoon, if you may call it that, uh, they're, they're there. The things, are, the things are there, whether it's coming to uh, acquiring, uh, and I call it institutionalized. Um, give you an example, uh, one of the things that kind of troubles me. And we're the IT center, in my mind, of the agency. Uh, historical black colleges, the number one um, uh, degree that they produce, the people coming out is normally in the IT world, programming, software, and things of that nature. That is the number one degree that is being produced by historical black universities. Yet, uh, in Silicon Valley, we say we don't have enough people to hire to have that background, and we press real hard. No disrespect for the people who have the education abroad, but we press real hard to make sure we could go out and get the people abroad and not take in consideration the number one category of individuals that are in an underrepresented group, the degree they're getting is IT, we don't even tap into. Okay? That troubles me. Now, I believe that as this center becomes more aware of that, they'll take advantage of that. I've seen that happen routinely now between two gentlemen that I really admire that, that understands this and seeks it out, and that is Eugene Tu, who's head of Code T, and as Tom Edwards, head of Code A. If you show them a talented individual, that is from one of those institutions, they'll grab them. They'll grab them. And that makes me very proud to be part of their team. But as far as uh, my youth, the youth coming up, I think the youth are going to find that things are sliding. Because you asked me if it's getting, I think they're going to slide. And I think our youth has a lot of what to do with helping it slide. You cannot command respect if you don't demonstrate respect publicly to yourself. So the media, the songs, the television programs that go about showing people being less than doesn't help. My generation understood that clearly. 
and they tried hard to make sure that those things didn't occur because they made it that much more difficult when they walked into a room to apply for a job to deal with those stereotypes. Okay? So I think it's better for me in this area of the, of the United States. I had opportunity to go work as an uh, agency-wide CFO at Goddard. Didn't want it because I didn't want to be in the Beltway. I didn't like what I saw. I knew if I went in the South because I'm very outspoken, there was no way I would have a career path for telling people to go take a flying lead. And um, didn't want to go to Houston because I would have been buried with my, my family side of the house, always dealing with the issues of being denied opportunities of jobs and growth. I think this is a great community. The only other community I think is as good as Northern California is the Seattle-Tacoma area. Okay, as far as ethnicity. I hope that answered your question. Check, check. Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to ask how much of a role did fear and practicality play into the decisions you made? Oh, um, a lot. <laughs> the greatest fear I have, is, and this, it's, it's, I deal with this every day, is when I make a decision over somebody's uh, life, that I didn't really think it through well to make sure that I, I considered every aspect before I decided that they, they're not qualified or they're not warranted or they're not good enough to be in a certain position. I have to think really hard. I, I, I always tell myself, can I look in the mirror and walk away and say that I did everything that I could to make sure that that person or that, it, that group had a fair opportunity to, to be successful? If, if I can walk away from that, I'm, I feel good. If I walk away and, and, and don't feel good, I, you know, that's my fear. I don't want to walk away and feel like I didn't give that person a fair shake. Okay? That, that's fear. The other fear I have is letting down organizations and groups. And um, even though I made the decision that, you know, I, I'm not going to be at Ames much longer, I always fear to letting down the people of Ames. I grew up here. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't want my legacy to be that I, I walked away uh, when things were at its toughest, or I set things up in such a way that people um, didn't fare well because I didn't, I didn't make sure I stayed in the game, or I didn't make sure I made the right decisions so that they can still have the type of life they're accustomed to being a part of this laboratory in this part of the country in the United States. Those things are always in my mind. And my wife gets tired of it because she says, when are you put the Blackberry down? We can't even go out and, and have a good romantic time because all you want to do is look at the Blackberry. Blackberry, Blackberry, Blackberry. <laughs> you know? So, but, you know, those things, those things with me all the time. I wonder what it's going to be like when I retire. Am I going to finally be able to just, and let somebody else have that, that responsibility? Okay. So, no? Got another one? Just a follow-up question to what you finished off, how you finished off. Uh, do you know, I mean, is it up to you who, who the, your responsibility goes down to after you plan to leave in less than a year? No. Politics, politics, <laughs> politics, okay? Uh, you know, like I said, a federal agency drives administration policies, platforms. And the administrator is a political appointee and most likely they're going to want to pick somebody that has their philosophy in mind. They're not going to want to pick somebody who doesn't have their philosophy in mind. I can give a recommendation. They're always going to ask for a recommendation. And I think there's about three individuals here, if they ask me who they are, which I'm not going to tell you, but there's three individuals that I would definitely make sure that the administrator and Pete Warden know I think are the right people to be in the job that I had. Okay? But the final call comes down to Pete Warden and the administrator. And it's, it basically is, where do, they want this, where do they want this agency and where do they want this center, this laboratory to be based on the current administration is kind of what it comes down to. Okay? So please join me in thanking our mentor and center deputy director, Lou Braxton.